The Maze Runner by James Dashner. Chapter 8. The alarm finally stopped after blaring for a full two minutes. A crowd was gathered in the middle of the courtyard around the steel doors, through which Thomas was startled to realize he'd arrived just yesterday. Yesterday, he thought. Was that really just yesterday? Someone tapped him on the elbow. He looked over to see Chuck by his side again. How goes it, Greenbean? Chuck asked. Fine, he replied, even though nothing could have been further from the truth. He pointed towards the doors of the box. Why is everyone freaking out? Isn't this how you all got here? Chuck shrugged. I don't know. Guess it's been a... Guess it's always been real regular-like. Once a month, every month, same day. Maybe whoever's in charge realized you were nothing but a big mistake. Send someone to replace you. He giggled as he elbowed Thomas in the ribs, a high-pitched snicker that inexplicably made Thomas like him more. Thomas shot his new friend a fake glare. You're annoying. Seriously. Yeah, but we're buddies now, right? Chuck fully laughed this time, a squeaky sort of snort. Looks like you're not giving much of a choice on that one. But truth was, he needed a friend, and Chuck would do just fine. The kid folded his arms, looking very satisfied. Glad that's settled, Greeny. Everyone needs a buddy in this place. Thomas grabbed Chuck by the collar, joking around. Okay, buddy, then call me by my name, Thomas, or I'll throw you down the hole after the box leaves. That triggered a thought in his head, and he released Chuck. Wait a minute, have you guys ever- Tried it, Chuck interrupted before Thomas could finish. Tried what? Going down in the box after it makes a delivery, Chuck answered. They won't do it. Won't go down until it's completely empty. Thomas remembered Albie telling him that very thing. I already knew that, but I was about tried it. Thomas had to suppress a groan. This was getting irritating. Man, you're hard to talk to. Tried what? Going through the hole after the box goes down? Can't. Doors will open, but there's just emptiness. Blackness, nothing. No ropes, nada. Can't do it. How could that be possible? Did you? Tried it. Thomas did, a, did groan this time. Okay, what? We threw some things in the hole. Never heard him land. Goes on for a long time. Thomas paused before he replied, not wanting to be cut off again. What are you, a mind reader or something? He threw as much sarcasm as he could into the comment. Just brilliant, that's all. Chuck winked. Chuck, never wink at me again. Thomas said it with a smile. Chuck was a little annoying, but there was something about him that made things seem less terrible. Thomas took a deep breath and looked back towards the crowd around the hole. So how long till the delivery gets here? It usually takes about half an hour after the alarm. Thomas thought for a second. There had to be something they hadn't tried. You're sure about the hole? Have you ever... He paused, waiting for the interruption, but none came. Have you ever tried making a rope? Yeah, they did. With the ivy. Longest one they could possibly make. Let's just say that little experiment didn't go so well. What do you mean? What now, Thomas thought. I wasn't here, but I heard the kid who volunteered to do it had only gone down about ten feet when something swooshed through the air and cut him clean in half. What? Thomas laughed. I don't believe that for a second. Oh yes, Mark I? I've seen the sucker's bones. Cut in half like a knife through whipped cream. They keep him in a box to remind future kids not to be so stupid. Thomas waited for Chuck to laugh or smile, thinking it had to be a joke. Who ever heard of something of someone being cut in half? But it never came. You're serious. Chuck just stared back at him. I don't like green uh Thomas. Come on, let's go over and see who's coming up. I can't believe you only have to be the green bean for one day, clunkhead. As they walked over, Thomas asked the one question he hadn't posed yet. How do you know it's not just supplies or whatever? The alarm doesn't go off when that happens, Chuck answered simply. The supplies come up at the same time every week. Hey, look. Chuck stopped and pointed to someone in the crowd. It was Galley, staring dead at them. Shuck it, Chuck said. He does not like you, man. Yeah, Thomas muttered. Figured that out already. And the feeling was mutual. Chuck nudged Thomas with his elbow, and the boys resumed their walk to the edge of the crowd, then waited in silence. Any questions Thomas had were forgotten. He'd lost the urge to talk after seeing Galley. Chuck apparently hadn't. Why don't you go ask him what his problem is, he asked, trying to sound tough. Thomas wanted to think he was brave enough, but that currently sounded like the worst idea in history. Well, for one, he has a lot more allies than I do. Not a good person to pick a fight with. Yeah, but you're smarter, and I bet you're quicker. You could take him and all his buddies. One of the boys standing in front of them looked back over his shoulder, annoyance crossing his face. Must be a friend of Galley's, Thomas thought. Would you shut it? He hissed at Chuck. A door closed behind them. Thomas turned to see Albie and Newt heading over from the homestead. They both looked exhausted. Seeing them brought Ben back to his mind, along with the horrific images of him writhing in bed. Chuck, man, you gotta tell me what this whole changing business is. What have they been doing in there with that poor Ben kid? Chuck shrugged. Don't know the details. The grievers do bad things to you. Make your whole body go through something awful. When it's over, you're different. Thomas sensed a, change, a chance to finally have a solid answer. Different? What do you mean? And what does it have to do with the grievers? Is that what Galley meant by being stung? Shh. Chuck held a finger to his mouth. Thomas almost screamed in frustration, but he kept his quiet. He resolved to make Chuck tell him later, whether 
whether the guy wanted to or not. Albie and New had reached the crowd and pushed themselves to the front, standing right over the doors that led to the box. Everyone quieted, and for the first time Thomas noted the grinds and rattles of the rising lift, reminding him of his own nightmarish trip the day before. Sadness washed over him, almost as if he were reliving those few terrible minutes of awakening in darkness to the memory loss. He felt sorry for whoever this new kid was, going through the same things. A muffled boom announced that the bizarre elevator had arrived. Thomas watched in anticipation as Newt and Albie took positions on opposite ends of the shaft doors. A crack had split the metal square right down the middle. Simple hook handles were attached on both sides, and together they yanked them apart. With a metallic scrape, the doors were opened, and a puff of dust from the surrounding stone rose into the air. Complete silence settled over the gladers. As Newt leaned over to get a better look into the box, the faint bleeding of a goat in the distance echoed across the courtyard. Thomas leaned forward as far as he possibly could, hoping to get a glance at the newcomer. With a sudden jerk, Newt pushed himself back into an upright position, his face scrunched up in confusion. "'Holy!' he breathed, looking around at nothing in particular. By the time Albie had gotten a good look as well, with a, simil with a similar reaction. "'No way!' he muttered, almost in a trance. A chorus of questions filled the air as everyone began pushing forward to get a good look into the small opening. "'What do they see down there?' Thomas wondered. "'What do they see?' He felt a shiver of muted fear, similar to what he'd experienced that morning when he'd stepped towards the window to see the griever. "'Hold on!' Albie yelled, silencing everyone. "'Just hold on!' "'Well, what's wrong?' someone yelled back. Albie stood up. Two newbies in two days,' he said, almost in a whisper. "'Now this. Two years, nothing different. Now this.' Then, for some reason, he looked straight at Thomas. "'What's going on here, Greeny?' Thomas stared back, confused, his face turning bright red, his gut clenching. "'How am I supposed to know?' "'Why don't you just tell us what the shuck is down there, Albie?' Galley called out. There were murmurs and another surge forward. "'You shanks, shut up!' Albie yelled. "'Tell him, Newt.' Newt looked down in the box one more time, then faced the crowd gravely. "'It's a girl,' he said. Everyone started talking at once. Thomas only caught pieces here and there. "'A girl? I got dibs! What's she look like? How old is she?' Thomas was drowning in a sea of confusion. "'A girl? He hadn't even thought about why the Glade only had boys, no girls. Hadn't even had the chance to notice, really.' "'Who is she?' he wondered. "'Why?' Newt shut them up again. "'That's not the bloody half of it,' he said. Then he pointed down into the box. "'I think she's dead.' A couple of boys grabbed some ropes made from ivy vines and lowered Albie and Newt into the box so they could retrieve the girl's body. A mood of reserved shock had come over most of the gladers, who were milling about with solemn faces, kicking loose rocks and not saying much at all. No one dared admit they couldn't wait to see the girl, but Thomas assumed they were all just as curious as he was. Galley was one of the boys holding onto the ropes, ready to hoist her, Albie, and Newt out of the box. Thomas watched him closely. His eyes were laced with something dark, almost a sick fascination, a gleam that made Thomas suddenly more scared of him than he'd been minutes earlier. From the deep, in the sh from deep in the shaft came Albie's voice shouting that they were ready, and Galley and a couple others started pulling up on the rope. A few grunts later and the girl's lifeless body was dragged out, across the edge of the door and onto one of the stone blocks making up the ground of the glade. Everyone immediately ran forward, forming a packed crowd around her, a palpable excitement hovering in the air. But Thomas stayed back. The eerie silence gave him the creeps, as if they'd just opened up a recently laid tomb. Despite his own curiosity, Thomas didn't bother trying to force his way to get a good look. The bodies were too tightly squeezed together, but he had caught a glimpse of her before being blocked off. She was thin, but not too small. Maybe five and a half feet tall, from what he could tell. She looked like she could be fifteen or sixteen years old, and her hair was tar black. But the thing that had really stood out to him was her skin, pale, white as pearls. New and Albie scrambled out of the box after her, then forced their way through to the girl's lifeless body, the crowd reforming behind them to cut off Thomas, cut off from Thomas's view. Only a few seconds later, the group parted again, and Newt was pointing straight at Thomas. "'Greeny, get over here,' he said, not bothering to be polite about it. Thomas's heart jumped into his throat. His hands started to sweat. What did they want him for? Things just kept getting worse and worse. He forced himself to walk forward, trying to seem innocent without acting like someone who was guilty who was trying to act innocent. "'Oh, calm it,' he told himself. "'You haven't done anything wrong.' But he had a strange feeling that maybe he had without realizing it. The boys lining to the path the boys lining the path to Newt and the girl glared at him as he walked past, as if he were responsible for the entire mess of the maze and the glade and the grievers. Thomas refused to make eye contact with any of them, afraid of looking guilty. He approached Newt and Albie, who both knelt beside the girl. Thomas, not wanting to meet their stares, concentrated on the girls. Despite her, her paleness, she was really pretty, more than pretty, beautiful. Silky hair, flawless skin, perfect lips, long legs, made him sick to think that way about a dead girl, but he couldn't look away. It won't be that way for long, he thought with a queasy twist in his stomach. She'll start rotting soon. He was surprised at having such a morbid thought. 
You know this girl, Shank? I'll be asked, sounding ticked off. Thomas was shocked by the question. Know her? Of course I don't know her. I don't know anyone, except you guys. That's not... Albie began, then stopped with a frustrated sigh. I meant does she look familiar at all? Any kind of feeling you've seen her before? No, nothing. Thomas shifted, looking down at his feet, then back at the girl. Albie's forehead creased. You sure? He looked like he didn't believe a word, Thomas said. Seemed almost angry. What could he possibly think I have to do with this, Thomas thought. He met Albie's glare evenly, and answered the only way he knew how. Yes? Why? Shuck it, Albie muttered, looking back down at the girl. Can't be a coincidence. Two days, two greenies, one alive, one dead. Then Albie's words started to make sense, and panic flared in Thomas. You don't think I— He couldn't even finish the sentence. Slim it, Granny, Newt said. We're not saying you bloody killed the girl. Thomas's mind was spinning. He was sure he'd never seen her before. But then the slightest hint of doubt crept into his mind. I swear she doesn't look familiar at all, he said anyway. He'd had enough ac accusations. Are you— before Newt could finish, the girl shot up into a sitting position. As she sucked in a huge breath, her eyes snapped open and she blinked, looking around at the crowd surrounding her. Albie cried out and fell backwards. Newt gasped and jumped up, stumbling away from her. Thomas didn't move, his gaze locked on the girl, frozen in fear. Burning blue eyes darted back and forth as she took deep breaths, her pink lips trembling as she mumbled something over and over and indecipherable. Then she spoke one sentence, her voice hollow and haunted, but clear. "'Everything is going to change.' Thomas star stared in wonder as her eyes rolled up into her head and she fell back to the ground. Her right fist shot into the air as she landed, staying rigid after she grew still, pointed towards the sky. Clutched in her hand was a wadded piece of paper. Thomas tried to swallow, but his mouth was too dry. Newt ran forward and pulled her fingers apart, grabbing the paper. With shaking hands, he unfolded it, then dropped to his knees, spreading out the note on the ground. Thomas moved up behind him to get a look. Scrawled across the paper, in thick black letters, were five words— She's the last one. Ever.